I'm going to ask you a question, and it's going to make you uncomfortable. In fact, pretty much everything I'm going to say over the next few minutes is going to make you uncomfortable. There is a good reason for this. Many of us are suffering. And the only way we can change this is by confronting some very uncomfortable truths about me, but also about yourselves and the people around you. So today, we're going to get uncomfortable together. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you or someone you know has been the victim of sexual violence. So that's any sexual activity without consent. That includes rape, sexual assault and abuse, and unwanted sexual contact, like indecent exposure and groping. And also includes sexual activity carried out on a sleeping partner and removing a condom without consent. If that's you or someone you know, Please raise your hand now. Thank you. I know that's not easy. According to the charity Rape Crisis, here in the UK, a third of women and one in six men will be victims of sexual violence in their lifetime. In the US, according to the charity Rain, somebody is sexually assaulted every 68 seconds, and every nine minutes, that victim is a child. That's about how long we have left of this talk. What all of this means is that even if you didn't put your hand up, I'm sorry, but the chances are you do know somebody who's been affected by this, but they haven't felt able to speak about it. And statistically speaking, someone watching this will have carried out one or more of those acts. How uncomfortable is that? The simple fact is many of us feel uncomfortable talking about sexual violence. I understand. I feel uncomfortable too. But when we don't talk about it, we keep survivors locked in shame and silence. We make them pay for someone else's crime. So this is my story. I was 19 and traveling alone on my summer break after my first year of university when I was drugged, tortured, and gang-raped by a group of men. The attack has left me with long-term physical and mental injuries, from burn marks and internal scars to nightmares, anxiety, depression, insomnia, and PTSD. A combination of shame and traumatic memory loss meant it would take me 19 years to be able to speak about what happened that night. And the truth is, I stayed silent, not just because I was ashamed, but because I was uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable with being a gang rape victim. I didn't want the attack to become my defining feature. I didn't want people to look at me differently or think I was lying or wanted attention. And I was uncomfortable because I didn't understand and I couldn't explain my own reactions, both during the attack and in the years afterwards. Like many survivors, I asked myself constantly, why did I trust those men? Why didn't I scream and fight? Why wasn't I better, faster, stronger? Why didn't I immediately report it and then move on with my life? So for years, like most survivors, I stayed silent because of shame and discomfort. I refused to discuss the details with anyone except my best friend, who I told a year later in a pub. I was assaulted in a toilet. I'm fine, though. Every so often over the years, I would try and tell somebody about the assault, but they would get uncomfortable, and I would get uncomfortable, and we would both revert back to comfortably ignoring it. Meanwhile, I was still suffering. The long-term psychological damage is something we don't talk about as much when it comes to sexual violence. But for me and many survivors, it isn't just a few hours in hell. So I spent the next couple of decades trying to get on with my life as best I could. I graduated, I got a postgrad, I traveled, worked, married, and I had two beautiful children. But all the while, I was burying my trauma with drugs and self-harm and other destructive behaviors. 
Like many survivors, those moments came back to me during dental exams and smear tests. So now vital healthcare made me gag and thrash and cry in fear. Those men came to me in the birthing room when I was fighting to bring my children into the world. The taste of them on my lips, the smell of them filling my nose instead of my baby's sweet scent. Even after all these years, the sound of a belt buckle or the smell of certain cheap colognes can still make me vomit. But what I didn't know at the time is that these are all common reactions to sexual violence. So the uncomfortable truth is that over the years, alongside the joys and the triumphs and the successes, I have also lost jobs and opportunities and even loved ones because of the darkness forced inside me one balmy summer night. Then, age 38, two significant events happened that forced me to start speaking out about my experiences. What I've learned along the way is something I really believe can help other people who've been impacted by sexual violence too, which, according to those statistics, it's quite a lot of us. The first significant event happened on a rainy autumn night in 2019. I was driving home, the radio was playing Cher, and she really, really believed in life after love. Suddenly, a car coming from the left hit mine at speed. The driver and the four passengers in the other car were all male. As they surrounded me at the side of the road after the crash, I suffered the most devastating flashback to the rape I'd ever experienced. For those of you who aren't familiar with flashbacks, they are an intensely vivid, visceral experience where you relive some aspects of a traumatic event or you feel like it's happening right now. They are the closest thing a human being can get to time travel. In the weeks and months after the car crash, I had a complete mental breakdown. I suffered a number of common trauma responses, including nightmares and flashbacks. I stopped eating and sleeping, culminating in me considering taking my own life rather than live with the memories. But I am a mum a daughter, a sister, a partner, a friend. I wanted to live for the people I love, just not like this. So I finally disclosed the details of the rape and its effect on me to a mental health professional, and I was swiftly diagnosed with PTSD. It's very common with sexual assault survivors, the mental health nurse told me. It's amazing you've managed this long. So with those words, Everything changed. You see, I had no idea that rape could cause such devastating mental ill health, especially after so long. I had no idea I wasn't alone in this discomfort and torment. So I began the long journey to recovery, and I did everything I was supposed to. I researched PTSD and rape trauma, I took medication, I sought therapy, but something was holding me back. Because despite everything I was doing, I just couldn't talk about that night. My memories were like a kaleidoscope. The images were there, but they were shattered and surreal. And then, because life just loves a curveball, just over six months later, I received a phone call that was to change my life yet again. Someone close to my family was arrested for a string of sexual offenses. I knew this man well. He had been in my home. The youngest of his victims was just a toddler. And his defense for abusing a three-year-old was because she won't remember. So on hearing those words, I literally fell to the floor. You see, they were the exact words that one of my rapists had used during the attack. Do what you want, he'd said she won't remember. Well, this was the final piece of the puzzle. Suddenly, this wasn't 19 years ago, I was back there in that dirty toilet, and I could remember everything. So the flashbacks got worse. During and after these flashbacks, I physically hurt in all the places they had hurt me. I'm ashamed to say, many mornings I woke up 
soaked in urine because I had lost control of my bladder during a nightmare, just as I had done during the assault itself. I couldn't stop thinking about the victims of the man I knew. They'd only just started to live, and now they would be forced to carry this with them forever. I was devastated and livid. I desperately wanted them to know somebody who'd been through a similar experience and wasn't ashamed or broken by it. But how could I do that when I was still too uncomfortable to share my own story? So on the 4th of July, 2020, 19 years to the day since my attack, I'd had enough of living in shame and silence. I decided to confront my discomfort and waive my right to anonymity. I posted a two-minute video on social media saying that if people wanted to talk about their experiences, I was around and that I believed them and I supported them. I set a goal of 100 views. I figured at least half of the people who saw it would have been affected by sexual violence in some way so that could be 50 people that I could help to feel less alone. Well, those 100 views turned to 1,000 and doubled and doubled again, and I was inundated with messages from friends and strangers all over the world. The youngest in their early teens, the oldest in their late 80s. I realized survivors did want to talk about what had happened to them, but in many cases, they just didn't know what to say or to who. Many of the men and women who contacted me would be genuinely unsure if what happened to them was rape. The answer in every single instance was yes. I'm sorry, it was. The myths about sexual violence were pernicious, even from the victims themselves. Many people thought that rape could only be carried out with violence, by a stranger, and they were assaulted by a friend who left no external marks. I would tell them, you are far more likely to be assaulted by a friend or a family member. And although stranger rape only makes up about a quarter of all attacks, it's somehow become the yardstick by which all rapes are measured. Many people were unfamiliar with how the body reacts to high-stress situations, and they blamed themselves for getting it wrong. Some people thought they'd been too willing or compliant, even though it was because they were afraid of being hurt or killed. Several people who told me their stories said it wasn't real rape because I just lay there. I just lay there too, I'd say. In fact, a Swedish study found that up to 70% of rape survivors report tonic immobility during an attack. It's just a fancy word for the freeze response. It's a natural biological impulse that's replicated across many species of animal. A deer freezing in the headlights doesn't want to be roadkill. It's not an indication that you wanted it. Others said, I didn't fight back, so who will believe me? Most people don't fight back, no matter what is portrayed in movies and on TV. In fact, if you're drugged, intoxicated, smaller or weaker than your attacker, or if you know them, you're much more likely to show a freeze or a fawn response, like pleading and trying to appear agreeable. These are all evolutionary responses that are designed to maximize your chance of survival. You did nothing wrong, I would say. Many people felt guilty that they hadn't reported it, because what if they've done it to someone else? You are not responsible, I would say. The only people to blame for rape are rapists. In fact, sexual violence, and rape in particular, is the world's most underreported violent crime. Here in the UK, for example, according to the Office of National Statistics, two-thirds of women and five in six men who are raped don't report. And across the world, most victims will take several months, if not years, to tell anybody about what has happened because of shame and self-blame. You are not alone, I would say. The following year, I released a podcast telling my story and looking at the long-term impact of sexual violence. We discussed rape myths, sexual violence in culture, media, and the legal system, and we looked at those common trauma responses. Again, I was incredibly, incredibly uncomfortable putting my story out into such a public space. 
I was worried it was going to impact my job opportunities in the future. And honestly, that people wouldn't want to talk to me once they knew. But my discomfort was worth it, because again, when it aired, I was inundated with messages from all over the world. I really needed to hear this, said one survivor. I thought it was just me, said another. I've never felt less alone. The most striking thing about my interactions with all these other survivors over the last couple of years is that no matter how different the circumstances, how similar our reactions all are, how we all share the same guilt and shame, discomfort and disbelief about what's happened. For the first time in my life, I feel surrounded by a tribe, no longer alone, but all of us against the rapists. It's only recently that I've come to recognize that it was when I started sharing my story, no matter how uncomfortable it made me, and hearing those experiences of others that I truly began to heal. I can't pretend it's an easy journey or stress enough how important it is that you find the right person to share it with, whether that's a charity, a mental health professional, a survivor support forum, or a trusted friend or relation. But when you're ready, there is help and support out there. And if you're not ready, that's okay too. Please just know you're not broken and there are millions of us all around the world just like you, even if you can't see us. You are not alone. The uncomfortable truth is for decades, I thought I was broken beyond repair. And now here I am, two years after coming out as a rape survivor, and I'm standing on a TEDx stage. In my darkest moments, I never dreamed that I had a story worth telling, or that by speaking out, I could help others to heal too. And that's why I decided to confront my discomfort because it isn't just for me, it's for all of us. <laughs>